you guys know that The Wheel of Time was almost an anime? Or that there was almost a script that was written by the same guy that did Fast and the Furious? If you want to know that and much more, check out our episode on the Watt TV history and what could have been The Wheel of Time. Greetings and salutations, my good friends. Welcome to another installment of the Watt Community Show. I'm Tom. I'm going to be hosting today's festivities. And as always, remember, I wouldn't be here without our sponsor, Tor Books, or any of you lovelies who support us over on the Dragon Mount on Patreon. We totally understand that it's a really tough time right now, and we here on the show only want you to help us financially if you're able to. But there's a really easy and free way to support this show and really any content that you enjoy. And that's toss out a like, subscribe, whether it's on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. Just share us around with your friends and family. You know how I'm pretty wholesome, right? Yeah. I mean, look at me. I'm good for all ages. Recently, DragonMount.com blogger Adam Whitehead published a fascinatingly in-depth article going deep into the long history that is the Wheel of Time meteorites. In it, he chronicled all of the hands that Watt has passed through while trying to be adapted into a TV series or movie or anime. If you want to read it in its entirety, follow the link that's down below. But I'm going to chat with you all right now about some of the highlights. So to begin, Robert Jordan sold the media rights to The Wheel of Time for the first time in 1999, when he was approached by The Peacock, NBC. At the time, NBC was really trying to ride the wave of their success of the Merlin miniseries with Dr. Alan Grant, Sam Neill, as the mighty magician himself. Merlin had some other names you might recognize as well. Helen and Bottom Carter, James Earl Jones, Rutger Hauer. And you know what? I really think I just talked myself into re-watching that miniseries. During this time, there were many studio higher-ups at NBC who were, in fact, also long-term Wheel of Time fans and who were the driving force behind that project, which inevitably lost steam when those said higher-ups left to move on to other ventures. Robert Jordan was optimistic about this effort, though, and you could take a listen to this audio clip from 2000. Um, Beowulf has just been made into a movie, and uh, A Wheel of Time's just also been made into a PC game. I was wondering, mm-hmm. do you see Wheel of Time possibly becoming a movie? Or have, have you been approached to it? Well, actually, I have in hand the contracts from NBC in, in the United States, which as soon as I get a chance I will sign and send back to them, mm. uh, by which they are buying the, uh, an option to do a mini-series based on the eye, uh, the eye of the world. Right. Um, the fact that they're buying an option doesn't mean that it will actually happen, of course, but they want me to be a consultant if it does, mainly to uh, make sure they don't do anything that will... S- cut off their ability to buy options on future books. Okay. They've outlined how they want to buy options on all of these books, and I, I find it very nice. It means like maybe they'd be doing they do two a year. The, who knows how many years they'd be doing the miniseries. Well, they've done, they've done Merlin, and they've it's done... It's the same, the same screenwriter who did Merlin. What did you think of Merlin? I thought Merlin was uh, all right. Yeah? All right. Uh, uh, not uh, not uh, Emmy caliber, but uh, all right. If they do... if if what I get is what they did in Merlin, mm-hmm. I'd be perfectly satisfied. So how much? How much? Input as long as I don't get what they did in Noah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just had that here the other week, yeah. and it was a bit of a worry, really. It was filmed uh, here as well. How embarrassing. Oh, good lord! Uh, yes, I, I think I, you know, I'd change the country's name or something. <laughs> <laughs> Which we tried. <laughs> so that sounds promising, right? I mean, even though the Merlin miniseries was well accepted, I'm pretty sure that that's a low bar by today's standards. So we're going to get a whole lot more than that. I'm pretty sure. Now, around the same time as the NBC effort, there was another unknown group that approached Robert Jordan about possibly making Watt into an anime. That's right, you heard me. Could you imagine Eye of the World being adapted as an anime? I mean, imagine if there were like typical anime tropes in Wheel of Time, like if Egwin or Nynaeve were like a tsundere character, you know, uh, if they like gave male protagonists characters a hard time, but really they were just interested in them romantically? Ashes. Uh, or if, you know, there were wolf people running around. Or, uh, I mean, you know, 
if like parents of young kids just were absent or dead or invisible and then they just sent their kids off into the world to deal with issues and then were never seen again for the rest of the book. Uh, and then the kids somehow save the day. Or if the hero would just be about to be stomped by an obviously stronger, more well-trained opponent only to pull out a hidden power and win the... Hey, was uh, Watt really a manga already and we didn't notice? No, really though, was it? <laughs> well, anyway, back in 1999, 2001, it almost was for reals. To quote Robert Jordan himself, and I'll, power, I'll paraphrase, I mean, y'all can pause and read it over here. A Japanese company contacted me about doing an anime movie. I told them no. They wanted to do a movie that was only two or three of the books, and I told them no, I won't do that. So thus ended the possibility of anime big yellow wolf brother eyes, or a big anime drip graphic on Nynaeve just before she bashes Lan with a cudgel for being a wolf head. After the NBC deal fizzled out, and since that anime effort went nowhere, the TV and movie rights reverted back to Robert Jordan, and then the next group to come along to scoop up the rights was a small company called Forsaken Films. They obtained the rights for the Wheel of Time TV adaptation in 2003. Their goal was to try to pitch the TV show to either HBO or the Sci-Fi Channel. No, not Sci-Fi. It was Sci-Fi back then. Like that. Man, that does bring back memories, though. I mean, at the time, the Sci-Fi Channel was just fresh off the Dune and Children of Dune miniseries. Uh, assisting for Forsaken Films were Larry Mandragon and Rick Selvig. Larry and Rick were two former lawyers who had begun a media branding business. When it became obvious that Forsaken Films wasn't going to get the movie project off the ground, Larry and Rick took control of the rights themselves and reconstructed the entire effort into what we now know as Red Eagle Entertainment. During the early days of the Red Eagle regime, they attempted to pitch the project to a wide range of studios. We know they approached HBO, Sci-Fi, Warner Brothers, Universal Pictures, and each of those efforts came and went like the wind. HBO was a long shot, in my opinion. It was just a shot in the dark. And Sci-Fi dropped out after other fantasy projects they worked on flopped. Warner Brothers ultimately passed as well, but not before having at least one set of writers produce story treatments for a potential feature film adaptation of Eye of the World. It was Universal Pictures that had a best shot at successfully producing a feature film. And an article in Variety in August 2008 proclaimed that the studio was spinning the wheel of time. Jeff Kirchenbaum was set to produce with Chris Morgan as the writer. Chris most known for the Fast and the Furious franchise, among other things. Though coincidentally, he also worked on a Legend of Conan project, which still has not seen the light of day. Coincidentally, because RJ also wrote in the Conan universe before what? Ultimately, the project was tabled because the Fast and the Furious franchise turned into, well, the Fast and the Furious franchise, and took up all of Chris Morgan's time. Around the same time that the projects waned from Universal, Red Eagle struggled with their Eye of the World and New Spring comic book ad adaptations that they went through Dabble Brothers for, as well as their video game efforts that they had under Red Eagle Games. All of the various graphic, novel, and video game projects were riddled with setbacks. There was a failed mobile game effort that never quite made it into development, and a failed Kickstarter project with Jet Set Games that only raised about $2,000. And then later, there was a partnership with Obsidian Studios to create an RPG based on the series, and at some point, they announced a distribution deal with EA that never went anywhere. All of this led Red Eagle to receive harsh criticism from fans and from Robert Jordan. Here's what Robert Jordan wrote on his blog at the time, which was hosted by Dragon Mount, and is linked down below. I'll paraphrase because you all can go and read, but... I hear things floating about Comic-Con in San Diego that I am displeased with Red Eagle. Too true. Too very true. In a few more months, that last contract they have will come to an end and we can see what happens after that. Among other things, they forgot the old dictum of Lyndon B. Johnson when he said, don't spit in the soup, boys. We all have to eat. Worse, Red Eagle thought they can tell me they spit in the soup or pee in it if they wanted to, and that there was nothing that I can do to stop them. You can't apologize your way out of that with me. Not that they tried. 
and there isn't enough money in the world to buy your way out of it with me. Not that they tried that either. So they get no further help from me, and once they're completely out of the picture, we'll see what happens. Damn, Jim, spitting that fire. Woo. Woo. Then the unthinkable happened. In the fall of 2007, Robert Jordan, Jim Rigney passed away. Red Eagle opted to take a less public approach to their efforts. We largely didn't hear anything from them until 2015. With their rights about to expire unless they can release something, they did the only logical thing they can do. They made an Ashcan film. Now you could be wondering, what's an Ashcan film? Well, I'm glad you asked. An Ashcan film is a movie or show that's produced, usually on a very tiny budget, to fulfill a legal requirement of producing a film so that they can retain rights to said project. Basically, Red Eagle had an agreement with Robert Jordan that said, hey, you can have the rights to make a Watt film, but only if you manage to produce something by a specific date. In Red Eagle's case, it was that day in 2015. So they made a super low budget movie called The Winter Dragon, which you can still find on YouTube. It starred Billy Zane of Titanic as Elon Morin Tedrani or Ishmael. Recently, Matt over on the Dusty Wheel did a recut of it and made it actually palatable. And I watched it for the second time <laughs> when he showed me that. This unexpected film ignited a bunch of lawsuits from Robert Jordan's estate and counter lawsuits from Red Eagle. They eventually set her out of court. In the end, Red Eagle retained the movie and TV rights to the series. They sold those to Sony, who in turn partnered with Amazon. And that leads us to where we are today. Thank the light we have Watt on Prime to look forward to with showrunner Ray Judkins at the project's helm and the likes of Sarah Nakamura and Brandon Sanderson himself consulting alongside the famed editor of The Wheel of Time, as well as many other acclaimed works, Harriet McDougall, uh, consulting on the project. I'm confident that the show will be a sight to see in the hands of these and the many other talented, unmentioned, brilliant people that are going to be on the show. I feel confident that they're going to create something that Robert Jordan would be proud of. For more info on Sony and Amazon Prime's efforts to adapt these amazing books, well, uh, check out our other episodes at dragonmount.com TV. Well, that's all I have for you today. Tell us what you think of Watt's history. If you had the rights for the series, how would you adapt it? And one more time, be sure to check out Adam Whitehead's article on dragonmount.com that we based this episode on. In the meantime, be safe, wear a mask, Black Lives Matter, peace our show. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, remember to subscribe and give us a thumbs up. And you know what? Leave us a comment. We love comments, especially positive ones. Also, if you have somebody that you know that loves the Wheel of Time, let them know about us. Also, a huge special thanks to our sponsor, Tor Books, as well as our amazing Patreon community. If you want to learn more about how this show is made or about the Wheel of Time in general, you too can become a Patreon. As always, please follow us on Dragon Mount. So we'll see you on social media and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.